okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, can I see the chat? I'm not sure if I can see the chat. I guess that's a bit of an issue. Can I see the chat on here, maybe? Uh, okay, yes, I can see the chat. Um, so, hi, hi, Plum. You're on. Uh, let's see. Okay. And let's wait a couple more minutes since we'll be starting at 10 after. Um, yeah. It's weird being back in the classroom. I haven't been in one of these since two years ago, I guess. <laughs> so are most of y'all uh, MSc students in the math department or? Uh, PhD. Oh, PhD student? Yeah. I'm an undergrad. Okay. So mix of undergrads, uh, PhD students. Uh, I assume we probably have some MSc students, but. And, uh, ah, yeah, uh, first year PhD. How many people are there in person? Oh, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. I can't count, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten people are here in person. So, and I think there are, what, four people online right now? So, yep. welcome, welcome. Uh, we we're just chatting a little bit before we actually get started in two minutes. So um, I, for the first two weeks, I will be doing this sort of simulcast to Zoom thing. I don't know if I'll continue this after the first two weeks. Um, also, because I'm doing this for the first two weeks, I am not using the chalkboard, but I'm using an iPad instead. So you guys should let me know if you prefer, like after the first two weeks, if we are not doing it online, then we can switch back to using a chalkboard, which, um, is out of, like has its has its pros and cons. Let's just say so. But you should feel free to give me feedback on all that once class actually starts. This will be online. Yes, yeah. So I am recording this. All my notes will be online as well. So you can you, like taking notes is often useful. But all everything I write down, I will be putting online. So um, yeah. Uh, this course. Uh, actually, I'll wait another minute before officially talking about what I'm doing. Actually, let's see, can I bring this course up? Uh, okay, there. Uh, and ignore all the random sheet music I have up. That is not relevant for this class. Okay, so it is now, uh, let's see, is my recording on? Let me see. Yes, my recording is on. Uh, I am able to see Lee chat. Um, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everyone. I am William Yu. I'm the assistant professor in the math department. I, this is my third year here now. And this will be Matt 1841, Mathematics of Massive Data Analysis, Fundamentals and Applications. So this course is going to cover a number of uh, vaguely related topics. The general theme of this class is I'm going to be talking about the shape and geometry of high dimensional data and the various algorithmic tools we have to shape it into things we like more. Um, and of course, uh, there are going to be several major threads. Uh, some of it's going to be algorithmic. Some of it's going to be um, very asymptotic. There are going to be a number of different topics. And uh, it is a survey course. Um, the background for this class is linear algebra probability and some algorithms background. Occasionally, I will make use of results from other fields of mathematics. Like there will be, when we're talking about hash functions, for example, there will be some nice little bits of group theory and number theory. When we're talking about some of the algebraic topology applications, obviously there will be some basic algebraic topology that I will, results that I'll use, but I'll try to keep this class relatively self-contained. Uh, so the structure of the course, there are going to be 11 homework assignments, um, subject to change, like there might be fewer depending on how lazy I get, but there'll be 11 homework assignments. They'll all be fairly short. There'll be like two or three questions, uh, roughly weekly, just to make sure you get a sense of, <coughs> excuse me, just to make sure you get a sense of what's going on in the class. And so it's not just me talking at you and um, you not actually taking anything in. The problems will be a mix of, of theory and implementation. I Usually I will have like two problems where I ask you to prove something. And then one problem where I tell you to go uh, do something in Python and or, or whatever language you like and uh, see what happens and how this is useful for actual data analysis. Um, so that will be, uh, let me pull up the syllabus. So 
A lot will be 50% of your mark in this course. 30% uh, will be a term paper and 20% an in-class presentation. So this class will involve a class project. You may choose a partner to work with you on that class project. Uh, there are a couple of different things you could do. One of them is just designing and implementing a data analysis method based off of some of the um, fundamentals we were talking about. Another one of them is you could always just prove a new result. Easier said than done. Uh, or lastly, you can perform a survey of a group of relevant articles, which is what most people end up doing. But uh, I like putting that last so that you guys at least think about doing the other two things. So there'll be a written report in the format of a conference proceedings uh, and uh, a short presentation to your peers, which we'll do at the end of the semester. So do you have any questions about all that? And also uh, audio check. Can the people on Zoom hear and see me fine? Uh, okay, great. So, um, any questions before we get started? Oh, yeah, so I mentioned that there was going to be a project, right? So um, for the project, I'm going to expect you to write a term paper as a report, uh, as well as give a presentation to the class. So think of it as if like you were doing, um, the way I like to think about it is if you wanted to submit something to a conference, you're going to need to write a report, do, do some work, so a project, and then you're going to need to write a report, so like in uh, conference proceedings, and then you're going to need to give a presentation. This is a graduate level topics course. And so ideally, the hope is that you'll be able to do that by the end of the course. Now, having said that, this is obviously a high bar, but that is the sort of goal that we aim for in a graduate topics course. Yeah, what's up? Yes, oh yeah. So. Um, I will be using this textbook. It's uh, uh, Foundations of Data Science by Avram Bloom, John Hopcroft, and Ravindran Kanan. Uh, so you can see that there as well. Um, so basically, I will be covering some of the chapters of this textbook. So you should think of me just ignoring a lot of the deep learning and machine learning chapters and taking out all the other interesting, more interesting mathematical chapters of this textbook. Um, some of the material I'll be covering won't be in this textbook. I will give additional references when um, I, I do that. So like, for example, I don't really like the wavelet exposition of this textbook. So when we talk about wavelets, I might uh, give you some other sources. And like this book does have very little about like to the random numbers and hashing. Um, or like, and almost nothing on algebraic topology. This textbook is completely available for free online through the University of Libraries, uh, University of Toronto Libraries. You do not need to buy it. I bought it because I like physical textbooks, but it is completely available online. You should be aware that there are various old versions of the textbook floating around online, which have slightly different numberings and all that. They still mostly work, but you should just go to the um, library, the University of Toronto Library website and get a copy of it from there because that's the most recent published version and it's also free. Oh, the published edition. So, so the, like for this textbook, the authors are putting up drafts of the textbook on their website like several years as they were writing it. Um, they're, I mean, the drafts are pretty good, but like it's actually published now. Okay, anything else? Let's go ahead and do some math one. Uh, so, uh, we're going to be interested in uh, one of our key ideas. Let me write this down. So let me give myself a grid. So the key idea that we're gonna be talking about uh, for today and tomorrow is that we're going to review some basic probability. So often, Expected behavior of a random variable behavior uh, is roughly the same as the, uh, yeah, so often the expected behavior of a random variable is not too far off, uh, far off from expectations. Or, sorry, let's thought the logical behavior of a I am rewriting everything too much. Let me try that again. So often the actual behavior, behavior of a random variable is not too far off from its expected behavior. So let's do a quick warm up and uh, just talk about some of our results, basic results from probability theory. So let's start off with Markov's inequality. So this is a, um, concentration inequality and uh, probably the first one that everyone sees. So uh, this is theorem 2.1 in the textbook, but really it's just Markov's inequality and it's in every standard probability textbook. So Markov's inequality uh, goes lustly. So uh, let uh, X be a non-negative random variable, non-negative random variable, uh, len for a greater than zero, 
the probability that x is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to the expectation of x divided by a. OK, and that's easy to prove. Let's remind ourselves how to do probability proofs. And these will occasionally be helpful. So uh, let's say let's, we're going to prove it for a continuous random variable with a probability density, uh, with a continuous probability density. Um, it's fairly similar for discrete variables. So let x be continuous with probability density p. Uh, and this is similar for discrete, but we're not going to worry about that. OK, so with probability density p, then, uh, well, just take some expectations. Expectation of x uh, is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity to x times p of x dx, which is equal to the integral from 0 to a uh, x times p of x d x plus the integral from a to infinity of x p of x dx, uh, which is greater than or equal to the, just the one part of it. So the integral from a to infinity of x p of x dx, which is greater than or equal to a times the integral from a to infinity p of x dx. And this is, of course, because since x is in the range a to infinity, and uh, so this is just equal to a times the probability of x is greater than or equal to a. And uh, that completes the proof. OK, so that's Markov's inequality. If you've taken a uh, probability class, you've probably seen it before. This is one of the most basic concentration inequalities. And basically, what we mean by concentration inequality is just that when uh, it's a state, it's a theorem about how close. Uh, you, uh, what probability you have of being some distance away from your expectation, at, at least for our case, uh, use case, that's how we're going to think about concentration inequalities. And this is a very weak one. Uh, you'll notice that we don't actually need very many conditions on A. All we have is that's a non-negative random variable. Uh, and if that's the case, Markov's uh, inequality holds. Often, when we know more about the shape of a random, I should uh, add something. If I start speaking too fast, you should um, just like raise your hand or shout at me or something. I have a bad habit of doing that. And I think I might be doing that right now. Um, but yeah, so feel free to interrupt me if I end up doing that again. Uh, if you don't interrupt me, I'll assume I'm going way too slow and boring you, and then I'll start speeding up. So uh, yeah, so let's mark up some quality. And we have some nice little corollaries which will become useful when we talk about uh, uh, some of the other theorems. So for example, probability of x greater than or equal to b times the expectation of x is less than or equal to 1 over b. So the chances that your random variable are, are b times your expectation are really small. And this makes sense, right? Because if it were uh, larger than b times its expectation with high probability, then, well, then the, expect the expectation would be higher. Yes. Yes, uh, all these notes are going to be available. Today's lecture is also largely from this textbook. And so um, there will be some things that are slightly different, but you can also follow on there. Uh, I will make everything available. Um, Actually, one of the things I could do is I could also make some like my free lecture notes available online beforehand. Uh, but if that's helpful to people, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, I don't know how much people will find that useful. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so if you find that useful, you should let me know because otherwise I won't do it because it's more work. Um, OK, so uh, that's uh, just Markov's inequality. Um, I swear we're going to get to some interesting uh, data geometry soon. But first, we need to remind ourselves of some basic probability. Um, Let's go ahead and remind ourselves of Trebuchet's inequality, which uh, is also a very standard uh, result from probability theory. So Trebuchet inequality. Uh, so if we let x be a random variable with bounded variance. So note that in uh, Markov's inequality, we didn't actually talk about variance at all. We just needed non-negativity. In this particular case, for a random uh, for x, we're going to assume that's a random variable with bounded variance. When for c greater than zero, the probability that x minus the expectation of x, the absolute value of that, so the distance that x is away from this expectation, the probability of that distance is greater than or equal to c is less than or equal to the variance of x divided by c squared. And so this should make sense intuitively, right? Because if you know what its variance is, then you can't be too far away often, or its variance would be higher. Um, so let's go ahead and prove this. Uh, so uh, the probability of uh, the distance of x from its expectation, let's for that to be greater than equal to c, is obviously equal to the probability if you just uh, square both uh, sides of the inside equation. 
and squared n equals to c squared. Uh, and then we just let y be equal to uh, x minus expectation of x squared. Uh, well, then what are we left with? Then y is a non-negative random variable. Uh, and we know that the expectation of y is equal to the variance of x. So then by Markov, we have that the probability that x minus the expectation of x is, oh, sorry, that's a absolute value sign, is greater than or equal to c, is equal to the probability that y is greater than or equal to c squared, which is less than or equal to the expectation of y over c squared, which is equal to the variance of x over c squared. Okay, so a simple application of a Markov once you like reframe the random variable in the right way. And this, of course, leads to one of the, uh, well, some of the more celebrated results in uh, statistics and probability theory, uh, the uh, law of large numbers. Law of large numbers, which is basically saying when you have a random variable that's the sum of a bunch of independent copies of random variables, then you get really, really nice tight bounds on, well, everything. Uh, so if we let uh, x1 through xn be independent samples, of a random variable x, then uh, the probability that uh, x1 plus dot 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 plus xn, the sum of all these over n minus the expectation of x uh, is greater than or equal to epsilon is great. Uh, that probability is less than or equal to the variance of x divided by n epsilon squared. Okay, so just if you have something that's a sum of a bunch of random numbers, then it tends to be close to its mean or to its expectation. And the proof of this is just by trebuchet's inequality. So you just have to plug this in. Uh, you can see that the form already looks pretty similar. So by trebuchet, we know that the probability that uh, this sum over n minus the expectation of x. Uh, variance to epsilon is less than or equal to the variance of, well, this random variable divided by n divided by epsilon squared. And of course, you can just use the rules about uh, variance and expectation, bring everything out. And so that's equal to one over n squared epsilon squared times the variance of the sum, which is equal to, uh, of course, uh, you can. Uh, Bring out the break out the variance linearly. So this is n squared epsilon squared times the sum of all these variances. But x1 through x are just independent copies of a single variable n. And so that's just the variance of x divided by n epsilon squared. Okay, so that was a really fast whirlwind uh, overview of some of the very basic uh, inequalities that you see in probability theory. Um, and all the theorems we just proved are examples of tail bounds. Um, so the point is that uh, we can use tail, tail, we can use these tail bounds to analyze typical behavior of a random variable. So um, and we can analyze typical points in the high dimensional space by just thinking of that point as a random variable in your, in the, your high dimensional space. And uh, it turns out that weird stuff happens in high dimensional space. So the point of today's lecture is that well, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard this before, but uh, the most of the volume of a hypersphere is near the um, boundary. So this is, this is a really fun, nice little result that uh, the proportion of a hypersphere that's near its surface uh, increases as the dimension goes up. Or, or uh, simultaneously at the same time, the amount of most of the points in a hypersphere are also along the equator of the hypersphere. These are both things that are true. Um, and it's one of the unintuitive facts about high dimensional space. And that's what we're going to be proving using these concentration inequalities today. Uh, so, the way we're going to approach this is we're going to consi consider points in RD. Uh, and let's start by considering some random Gaussian points, since Gaussians are nice and easy to work with. So let's uh, separate this out. So consider uh, random Gaussian points. So let's consider a random Gaussian points in R to the D, by which I mean that each of the independent, each of the coordinates of our points are going to be uh, Gaussians uh, with uh, mean zero and variance one. So but I'm going to I'm going to try to remember to use this uh, arrow uh, up arrow notation to refer to vectors. I will forget sometimes, so I apologize, but I'll try to do that. So we're going to let y be equal to 
uh, a bunch of coordinates y1 through yd, which is going to be in uh, r to the d, and z be equal to z1 through zd, which is also in r to the d. So consider two random points in uh, uh, d-dimensional Euclidean space. We're mostly going to be working with Euclidean space in this course, although I will mention when we do something different. So what do we have? We have yi's and zi's, uh, i's, i's, are iid with PDF uh, equal to one over square root of two pi e to the minus one half x squared, uh, by which we just mean that uh, IE of YI is about a normal with mean zero and variance one. Okay. So uh, these are just the um, independent Gaussians with unit variance. So what can we say about, and we say about, the distance between y and z. And so notice that this distance is some uh, is a random variable. And what we'd like to be able to say is that it is tightly bounded with high probability. So now, is this always the case? So if you're in low dimensions and you just have y and z are both Gaussians, well, yes, you do have some bound on the distance between them, but uh, it'll depend on uh, if you draw a Gaussian, it'll depend a little bit on where you are. And so you have some bounds on the distance. It turns out that the distance between y and uh, z get uh, the bound on how far away they are from each other gets even tighter as you go into higher dimensions of basically because of the law of large numbers. Uh, since we have lots of independent copies of the Gaussians which uh, compose our uh, coordinates. Uh, so let's um, actually do that. Uh, so let's do that formally. So y minus z squared, uh, so well squared distance uh, is going to be equal to the sum from i equal one to d of each of our coordinates. Y i minus z i squared. And so of course we can just let xi be equal to uh, yi minus zi squared. So this is a random variable with bounded variance. And we know how to do lots of stuff with that, right? So it's a random variable with bounded variance. And so therefore, by the law of large numbers, the probability that x1 dot 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 plus uh, x, uh, sorry, not xd, x, or sorry, not xn, xd, divided by d uh, minus the expectation of x, uh, by which I mean uh, each of these is a, uh, that's the distribution that the xi's come from, uh, is greater or equal to the variance of x divided by d epsilon squared. And so what we're basically saying with this is that the distance is actually really close to the expected distance. And as the dimensionality gets higher, it, um, the deviation from your expected distance between uh, y and z uh, decreases. Uh, as the uh, d goes to infinity. So if you had, well, a really, really large uh, dimensional Gaussian vector in really, really high dimensions, then the distance between any two uh, of these Gaussian points is really, really tightly constrained. Um, with a little bit more machinery, we can actually prove even, even stronger facts about this. And so I'm going to give you a little bit more machinery. I'm not going to prove all of it now because this is not a probability class. If there were, this were a probability class, we would be proving all this machinery. Um, it isn't, so we're not, but you should, some of the proofs are in the book if you're interested in the, how to prove these things. So this is going to be theorem 2.5 in the book, uh, which is the, what the authors call the master tail bounds theorem. Because if you prove this, you can prove a number of other really useful tail bounds, such as Chernoff bounds, Gaussian analyst theorem, and things like that. Yeah? Um, so is it true that, I mean, are we assuming that yi and zi are all of them or iid? Or yes, we're, we're assuming that all of the coordinates are iid Gaussian. So uh, obviously, if you have some dependence between them, then um, these results don't uh, necessarily work. So for example, if uh, all your yi's were, well, the exact were equal to just a single, if they're completely dependent and they're just all equal to some variable, well then no, you wouldn't get this behavior because then that would be the same as if you're in just one dimension. So this is uh, assuming that you're actually truly high dimensional. Um, whereas, uh, and you, you, don't, you don't live on some lower dimensional space, which is basically what you're proposing with these dependencies. Okay, uh, anything else? So uh, we're going to describe this theorem uh, and it's going to allow us to, uh, some of the quick um, corollaries of this theorem include things like turnoff bounds, which you may have heard of uh, in uh, uh, probability before, or may not, it doesn't really matter. But uh, so let me state this in a law of generality. Uh, it is a, there are several technical conditions on it, which you don't worry too much about. Um, we're not going to worry about that too much in this course. So if we let x1 be equal to x1 plus uh, through xn, 
where our x1 through xn are mutually independent, independent random variables uh, with zero mean and variance at most sigma squared. So note that these don't have to necessarily be drawn from the exact same distribution. Just all of them have to be bounded by uh, the, the have this bounded variance. Uh, and we're going to let zero be less than or equal to a is less than or equal to square root of two n sigma squared. So some, for some constant a. Uh, so this is a technical condition that will be needed for the proof of the theorem. Uh, and we're going to assume that the expectation of xi to the s is less than or equal to sigma squared s factorial. Again, another technical condition for s equal three, four, all the way through, uh, well, all the s's that matter. I think this goes up to the floor of a squared four and sigma squared. Um, when, given all this, the probability that the absolute value of x is greater than or equal to a is less than or equal to 3e to the minus a squared over 12n sigma squared. OK, so this has the same form as these tail bounds. It's a lot more general. And we're not going to fully prove it. Um, it's, uh, we are going to give a proof sketch just to give you a sense of why we need all these different technical conditions. But we're not going to do it rigorously. You can uh, follow through. The proof is in the book. And it's, it's relatively elementary, so you could, in theory, just do it yourself. So. Our proof sketch is we're just going to apply Markov to x to the r, where r is large and even. So we know that x to the r is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, we choose evenness because we need positivity in order to apply Markov. Um, and then once we do that, then the probability that x is greater than or equal to the absolute value of x greater than or equal to a is equal to the probability that x to the r is greater than or equal to a to the r, which is less than or equal to the expectation of x to the r over a to the r. And you can compute the expectation of x to the r by expanding out x is equal to x1 through uh, x, uh, what was n, and using uh, properties of the expectation. So things like linearity of the expectation and the technical assumptions. And what you'll find is, we'll find that this expectation is not too large. OK, like I said, um, I'm just sort of, sort of throwing this at you because uh, in practice, whenever you're trying to analyze uh, analyze these behaviors, you you can just take these uh, various tailbound theorems, uh, many of which have been proven by the probabilist, and apply them, and that allows you to. Uh, uh, and so, using this theorem, we can uh, get a number of other useful tailbounds. So let me just write down a few of the more useful ones that we'll be using later in this uh, today's lecture, hopefully, or if not, then tomorrow's lecture. So more useful tailbounds uh, include. Uh, the Chernoff bound, which I personally really like. The Chernoff bound, uh, which uh, says that, uh, let me give a different condition as well as the tail bound. So we have the Chernoff bound, which says that if X is equal to X1 through Xn, for each of our Xi's are um, uh, 0, 1 IID Bernoulli uh, random variables. So basically weighted coin flips. So if we have a sum of a bunch of weighted coin flips, then we can say something really precise about uh, the probability about the, the, the sum. So then the probability of X minus the expectation of X is that that's greater than or equal to epsilon the expectation of X is less than or equal to three E to the sum constant minus C epsilon squared of, uh, expectation of X. And note that there are actually many different forms, many different variants of turnoff bounds. Uh, which use slightly different proof techniques. This is the one you get by applying the Meister tail bound theorem. There are tighter bounds that you can get you, uh, that are all under the rough category of turnoff bounds. So basically, this is saying that if I flip a coin one million times, then I am, uh, if, I, if I flip a fair coin a million times, the expectation is you're going to get a half million heads, right? 
And this is basically saying that you're going to get a half million heads and it's not going to be too far away from a half million, relatively speaking. Okay, so it's really unlikely to get six, uh, 600,000 heads uh, if you're flipping a coin uh, 100, a million times, assuming it's a fair coin. Whereas if you flip a coin only 10 times, getting it six times heads, well, that's more likely. And this depends on, uh, well, how many times you flip the coin. Uh, there are a couple other ones that may be useful. So we have the higher moments inequality. So if we have R is positive, even integer, well, on the probability that X, uh, the absolute, oh, sorry, greater than or equal to, greater than or equal to A is less than or equal to the expectation of X to the R over A to the R. And this one's just a straight application of Markov's inequality to X to the R. Uh, so this is just by Markov. Uh, and uh, one that we will actually use uh, later uh, when we talk about the John Lindenstrauss dilemma. Um, so that will probably be not in, be in today's lecture, it'll probably be in tomorrow's lecture. The basic idea behind that is that if you have a bunch of points in high dimensional space and you want to preserve pairwise distances uh, in the lower dimensional space, how can you do an embedding like that? It turns out that one really easy answer is you just multiply everything by a random matrix uh, that uh, decreases the dimensionality of your points. And then with high probability, your distances will be preserved. So this is the John and Linden stress level, which we'll prove in probably tomorrow. Um, and these, these sorts of projections are really helpful for data analysis. We were talking about how do we shape high dimensional data? And one of the tricks is, well, high dimensional data is hard to work with, but if you can bring it down to a lower dimensional embedding, well, then life is good. And one good way of doing that is just multiply by something random and you're probably going to work. Um, Let's see, so, uh, and to prove that, we'll need the Gaussian annulus theorem, which is that if X is equal to the square root of X one squared plus dot, 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 plus X N squared. So uh, this looks something like a distance uh, because that's exactly what it is. Uh, so if you have a random variable flat shape and each of your X size comes from a normal distribution, uh, zero one uh, with a uh, mean zero variance one, and you have some constant beta that's less than or equal to the square root of N, then the probability that the distance between x and the square root of n, uh, sorry, of x minus the square root of n, is greater than or equal to beta. That probability is less than or equal to 3e e to the minus c beta squared for some uh, constant c and some constant beta. OK, so basically, uh, all these bounds are just saying that uh, when we have these random variables that uh, we can say stuff, uh, especially in the case where these random variables are composed of the sum of a bunch of copies of other variables, then it turns out that we can, even if, even in the context of randomness, we can tightly bound their behavior uh, after some operation. And this is super powerful. Uh, and one of the ways we're going to apply this now is we're going to talk about uh, what I was describing earlier. In high dimensional geometry, in a, high, in a, a high dimensional hypersphere, most of the volume is near the surface. Um, and most of the volume is near the equator. And most points are orthogonal to each other. These are all simultaneously true statements that you get in high dimensional space, which are a little bit unintuitive, right? Uh, how can most points be orthogonal to each other and most points all be along the equator and most points all be along the surface? Um, and this is just one of the unintuitive things about high dimensional space. Any questions before we go on? So we've just taken some, sorry, pause. Okay, no questions. So what we've just done is we've just reviewed some of the probabilistic preliminaries and we'll be using these techniques to prove uh, these facts about high dimensional space that we care about. Uh, so the first thing we're going to prove, uh, and this is going to be relatively elementary. So most volume of high dimensional objects, objects, not just spheres, but high dimensional objects in general is near the surface. Okay, and let's take a, let's slow down a little bit because these are things that are this is intuition that's important to have. So suppose that we were working in one D. So if we're working in one D and we have a um, hypersphere in one dimension, uh, anyone want to tell me what that is? Yeah, it's just the line segment. So we have a hypersphere in one dimension. So uh, let's say it's a uh, hypersphere of radius one. So you go from minus one to one, uh, and then let's look at what's along the boundary. How much volume is close to the boundary? So Let's say we have some epsilon portion along the boundary. And so what's the volume fraction? So the volume of the um, fraction near the surface, uh, by which we mean the surface, meaning, meaning the two endpoints, is just going to be about two epsilon divided by two, which is the total volume is equal to epsilon. Well, by volume, I mean length here, since we're working in 1D. 
Um, so then what happens when we're looking at a circle? So let's draw a circle, if I can draw a circle. Um, and uh, let's draw a look at the boundary and distance epsilon away from the boundary. Okay, so we're distance epsilon away from the boundary. So this is an annulus uh, with epsilon. Well, what's the volume fraction here? So the volume fraction is just going to be approximately two pi epsilon. <coughs> oh, sorry, excuse me, divided by pi. So two pi epsilon divided by pi, well, that leaves us with uh, two epsilon. So you see that as we go from one dimension to two dimension, all of a sudden the fraction of the volume that's near the surface increases, right? Well, let's keep on going. Uh, let's draw a sphere because the sphere is still drawable. Um, unfortunately, I, I find it really difficult to draw in 4D, so we'll have to end at three. So if we have a sphere here, um, I'm not going to try to draw the surface of the sphere, just you can just sort of imagine it and imagine an epsilon uh, thick uh, surface that's uh, just extending out to, into it. Well, in order to calculate that volume, all you need to do is take the uh, surface area of a sphere and multiply it by epsilon, right? So then you get a volume fraction which is approximately equal to four pi epsilon divided by four thirds pi, which is equal to three epsilon. And this sort of trend continues. So the, as, uh, um, N get, as dimension D gets really, really big, the fraction that's close to the surface gets increases over and over again. Uh, obviously there are like, you have to be a little bit careful when you start going to high dimensions, but let's actually uh, uh, deal with this a little bit more rigorously now. Um, so consider any object, so rigorously, more rigorously at least, more rigorously consider any object, uh, and we're just gonna consider an object as a point cloud in R to the D. Um, so since A, uh, sorry, shrink A. So to some object in uh, D dimensional space, we're going to shrink A by epsilon. And what do we mean by that? We're going to take the entire object and we're just going to shrink it a little bit. Uh, because then what's left over, uh, assuming you had to have some compact, nicely centered object, what's left over is going to be the boundary. Uh, so that's the basic intuition there. And then that allows us to quickly compute the size of the, uh, how much mass is contained in the, in the near the surface versus uh, in the bulk of the object. So more rigorously, uh, we shrink A by epsilon to produce uh, one minus epsilon times A, which we're just going to define as the set of all points, um, uh, one minus epsilon X, given that X was in the original point. So obviously um, like in the intuition, I have it shrunk so that everything's still contained within the original object. If you have some weird shaped object, that might not be the case, but it doesn't really matter for our analysis. So Glenn, we know that the volume of one minus epsilon times uh, A, uh, I sh I've been using parentheses, sorry, not curly brackets. Volume of that is equal to, well, just one minus epsilon to D volume of A. And this is fairly easy to prove. Uh, so I'm just gonna give a proof sketch. It's just basically a scaling behavior of your dimensionality, which uh, should be fairly uh, expected. So what we're just gonna do is we're gonna partition A into infinitesimal squares, infinitesimal uh, cubes, hypercubes. Well, when one minus epsilon A is the union of the set of cubes obtained uh, by shrinking cubes, by shrinking each of the cubes, by shrinking the cubes by a factor of one minus epsilon. So now when we do that, uh, well, each of the cubes, so the side length shrinks by one minus epsilon and so the overall area of volume uh, shrinks by one minus epsilon to D. So uh, well, let me write that down. Shrinking side lengths by one minus epsilon implies shrinking volume by one minus epsilon to the D. Uh, and let's see, and that basically concludes this proof, a uh, proof sketch at least. Um, and now note that one minus uh, X is less than or equal to E to the minus X. Uh, so for any A contained in R to the D, we know that the ratio of these volumes, the volume of 
one minus epsilon A divided by the volume of A is equal to one minus epsilon to the D, which is less than or equal to E to the minus epsilon D, which goes to zero as D goes to infinity. Okay, so that basically concludes this uh, simple argument that the most of the volume is contained in near the surface. Uh, so uh, by less most volume does not belong belong to one minus epsilon a. And so if it doesn't belong to one minus epsilon a, it has to belong to the surface, obviously. Okay, so let's go back to the uh, unit ball. So let's see, going, yeah, what's up? Are you assuming that they're not asymmetric around the origin or any pieces, kind of? I mean, uh, this is dilating. Rather than shrinking, right? I mean, yeah, so like, uh, like, like I said, this is a little bit of a heuristic argument. Um, it, it obviously works in the case of something that's nicely centered and like has a nice shape. Um, in, in the other cases, all you're doing is you're saying that if you shrink, yeah, so, so like you might move things around if you, you, you didn't center your object entirely, but like that still doesn't change the fact that if you take an object and you shrink everything a little bit, um, even if you're dilating, you're moving it, but you're shrinking it a tiny bit, the volume of the shrunken version is going to be much, much lower than the volume of the bigger version. And that's all we're saying. But, uh, and what that means uh, intuitively is that most of, the, most of the stuff you shrunk away. And when you shrink most, and so we're going to interpret that as saying that uh, it, the stuff is near the boundary. Make sense? Yeah, but yeah, that's absolutely correct. This argument doesn't work exactly. You have to play around with centering and stuff like that. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's go back to the unit ball. Uh, where all these problems don't matter because it's a unit ball and so shrinking it, obviously you still get a unit ball, right? So going back to the unit ball, unit ball, uh, let's call it S contained in R to the D. Uh, actually, maybe I'll call that, I call it S? I call it S sub D. Uh, well, well, we'll call it S for now. Um, I think I might use different notation later, so I apologize for that, but let's call it S. Uh, actually, I will just use the other notation. Let's call it B sub D just to keep all my notation consistent. So it's a unit ball of in D dimensions. Uh, then we have that the volume of one minus epsilon times B sub D divided by the volume of B sub D is less than or equal to E to the minus epsilon D. So what that means is the volume of S uh, minus, so subtract out uh, one minus, oh, I keep on using S because that's what I have in my notes. Well, let's just use b sub d everywhere. One minus epsilon b sub d is greater than or equal to uh, one minus e to the minus epsilon d times the volume of the uh, hyperbole. Okay, and if we let epsilon be equal to one over d, then what we're left with is that this volume, uh, so uh, this volume near the boundary, one minus one over d. Sorry, you should stop me every time I write S because I'm just copying my notes and I have it. I used the bad notation there. But it's greater than or equal to one minus E to the minus one volume of B sub D, which is approximately equal to 0 0.632 times the volume of B sub D. Um, so most of the material, so literally most of the material is contained in an annulus of uh, width one over D. So most, because we have over half of the volume, this volume is contained in an annulus of width one over D near the boundary. And so basically what we have is we just have a circle and or this hypersphere and uh, this distance here is going to be one over D uh, and most of the volume is going to be contained in here. Okay, so that's a nice little result. Uh, well, now let's prove the, uh, uh, which by itself isn't that unintuitive, right? Uh, yeah, you're like, okay, yeah, sure. Uh, as you scale up dimension, the surface area increases. We all knew that. Um, this, uh, I'm a biologist, or I'm a computational biologist, and one of the things that we all know is that there's squared scaling behavior, and so you don't want, like, uh, in order to have increased surface areas, the, the, as the dimensionality grows, you need to do weird stuff sometimes. But now let's talk about some of the another fact which combined together it makes it a little bit less intuitive. So most points in a unit ball. Sorry, I'm 
Professor, I have a question. So, what was the difference between this this year and the, the, the last year? Because last year the 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 the, 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 the ratio goes to Y, right? Oh, so so um, uh, which one? So. Oh, I'm just applying that to um, and giving a specific value for epsilon, basically. Yeah, yeah. So here, what we're saying is that I, I can give you a very precise bound. Like, if you have a strip, uh, if your epsilon is equal to one over d, then over half of the points are going to be uh, near the surface. Whereas previously, I just said that as d goes to infinity, something that's along the surface is going to uh, go go to one. Yeah. So, so uh, in in the previous case up here, uh, all I said is that. Uh, as d goes to infinity, um, if I have some fixed epsilon, uh, then uh, the, the, the mass is going to go to zero, right? Yeah. Whereas here I'm saying, well, if I instead of fixing epsilon, I just at every dimension, I uh, choose one over d as the size of epsilon. Uh, well, then half of my points will be near the surface. So here d doesn't go to infinity. But yeah, you don't need d to go to infinity. There's no matter what, but like you'll notice that basically what we're saying is that as D gets bigger, the thinness of the strip near the surface, like you can get closer and closer to the surface and still get half your points. So yeah, so that's the slight uh, intuitive difference between this and the last result. Yeah. So most points in the unit ball are nearly orthogonal. Now this doesn't seem right, right? Because if you're in two dimensions, well, if you're in two dimensions and you have a point here and here, they're not very orthogonal, right? Uh, where, whereas a point like here and there would be orthogonal. But then in high dimensions, nearly every pair of points is uh, almost orthogonal. So let's formalize it a little bit. Uh, in order to formalize it, we of course need to define what we mean by nearly orthogonal, and we're gonna do that using the dot product. So recall the dot product. So hopefully you all know this. If you don't, well, you should really take the near algebra. Um, but let's go ahead and recall it. So recall a dot product, which is just, if you have two vectors, A and B, uh, then that's going to be equal to uh, the sum from i equal one to d, where d is our dimension, uh, a i b i is going to be equal to the length of a times the length of b times cosine of theta. And so uh, if this is a and this is b, then this is theta. Okay, so that's the dot product. So uh, what we can say is a dot b is small. Uh, that is approximately saying that a and b are nearly orthogonal. Okay, so uh, this is how we're going to uh, state that the, the things are nearly orthogonal by just using the dot product. So the dot product of most things is close to zero. Okay, so what are we going to do now? So we're going to, uh, in order to show this, we're going to first uh, show that most points are orthogonal to a particular point. Uh, someone is calling me. I am going to decline this because I am in the middle of a class. Um, can the people on the Zoom double check to make sure everything's still working? Uh, since I hope that didn't break anything. Did that break my, okay, no, Zoom is still working. Okay, good, okay, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I should really turn my phone on to silent note when I'm teaching. Um, but yeah, uh, actually, uh, it's a good thing I noticed that because I am running out of time. So I am not actually gonna get through all of my material for today. Uh, clearly I need to speak twice as fast tomorrow, um, but anyway. Uh, well, let's uh, let's give a sense of what we're going to do uh, in the next five minutes. Actually, maybe I do have time for this particular. Uh, it's going to be close. So, so uh, what we're going to basically show is that we're going to fix a particular point. So, uh, instead of just saying that any two pairs of points are orthogonal, we're going to say uh, I'm going to just going to draw this as a three sphere, um, not a not a three sphere. I'm going to draw this in three D. So it's going to be. Uh, a ball of three dimensions, and what we're going to do is we're just going to fix some point as north. Obviously you can fix any point as north, we're just gonna fix the first coordinate dimension so that makes life easier. And then we're gonna show that most points are orthogonal to this, this point that we fixed as north. And obviously what that's going to mean is that uh, most points are orthogonal to one particular point, but this point was arbitrary. So any, so you could have picked any two points and they would still have been orthogonal. Uh, and let me go ahead and set up a little bit of the preliminaries. So what we're gonna do is uh, fix uh, any unit vector vector oh let me rewrite that let's say without loss of generality if we're going to fix the first unit vector as north without loss of generality fix uh e sub one so the first coordinate vector uh the first coordinate vector 
coordinate vector as north. Well, when, uh, well, the dot product is super easy. When the dot product uh, is just equal to the first coordinate. Um, and so all we have to do is we need to analyze the first coordinate. Um, and we want to show that, uh, what we're going to show here is if we want to show that something's orthogonal to the north direction, then basically what we're saying is that we want to show that everything's close to the equator, right? So because that, that means that it would be uh, 90 degrees to your first coordinate uh, the, up north. And so instead, if everything's uh, near the equator, then that means that they're about orthogonal to your, uh, the point that you care about. And so on, well, Friday, but I guess that's tomorrow, we're going to prove that everything is actually uh, tightly concentrated in a band around the equator. And so everything is near the equator and everything's near the boundary uh, and everything's orthogonal. And these are all just fun facts about high dimensional hyperspheres. And with that, um, I do, really don't have time to actually go into this proof. So uh, I will hold that off until tomorrow. And uh, so tomorrow we will be covering, uh, well, this particular proof that everything's orthogonal. And then we'll also be talking about Johnson and Strauss, which is a really cool random projection theory, uh, theorem, which I mentioned earlier, basically saying that, well, if you just take random values and multiply them by your high dimensional vector, you get some low dimensional vector that somehow magically almost preserves distances. And it's great. So, yeah. Okay, well, thank you all so much. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed this class. If you're not on the Quirkus site already, you should email me or something or like talk to Jemima because that is how I'm going to be making announcements. There will be information posted on the website as well. And at some point I will upload this video, although you guys are all here, so you heard everything already. Um, yeah, so class is dismissed. I will be around for a little bit, though I do need to run off uh, for an appointment at 4.30. But yeah, so uh, I will stop my recording now. Uh, so bye everyone on chat. I will see you tomorrow. Thank you.